So I can switch this. All right, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. And is that picking up like you wanted to? All right. <laughs> As if you couldn't hear me without a mic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna set up from 30,000 feet what John is gonna demonstrate for you as technology. And uh, I entitled this talk, Rubbing, the, Rubbing on the DevOps, for a reason you'll see in a moment. Uh, my name is Boyd Hemphill, I'm the CTO at Victory CTO. As I just said, that means I don't really know anything, so pay attention to John, eat now. Um, I'm a community guy, I founded Austin DevOps about five and a half years ago, I've been running that. Um, I'm part of the organizing crew for DevOps Days Austin. Uh, that's gonna be very, very technology focused this year, not touchy feely. If you've got cool stuff to say around PHP and DevOps, please make sure you uh, answer the CFP. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be, uh, we'll be picking 60 talks and doing it like product camp as a, as a complete open space for the entire conference for two days. Um, I did Container Days Austin the first year. Uh, that was the first Container Days in the world. It since has gone worldwide. I didn't have much to do with that. Um, and I ran Docker Austin for a couple of years while I was doing the evangelism thing. I was also um, the co-host of this meetup with Derek for, I guess, three years really, right? Um, yeah, uh, when Josh Butts um, took it over for Andy Meadows, uh, we brought it here and it's had a home ever since. Thank you. That means you have to be here every month and I know what that means. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, and I've been a developer, I've been a DBA, and I've been an operator, which is what makes me angry. So <laughs> you'll get that. So this is, my, this is my current employer. He's the guy who wooed me away from my IDU by basically saying, uh, hey Boyd, I made a thing. Uh, come rub some DevOps on it and make it better. <laughs> That's the title of the talk. <laughs> uh, back then in 2009, um, we didn't know it was called DevOps. Uh, Patrick and uh, uh, Paul, the guys who came up with the whole term, uh, we're just kind of getting it started back then anyway. But we were doing a devops -y stuff. Um, so what's John going to show you? Well, he's going to talk, um, I'm sorry, jumped ahead a little bit. There we go. All right. He's going to talk about how he, we take code, in our, in, this, in our case, PHP, a Laravel project. We send that through Travis, CI, build some things. We produce an artifact, lands in S3, right? Yep. And then... That, art, that artifact then is deployed into Elastic Beanstalk. And that's all great, man. Tool, 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 tool. Why do we pick those tools? Why that particular tool chain? What's motivating us? And why do our customers like what we do and ask us back for more? That's really what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to motivate why we did that. I'm not saying it's right for you. My hope is, though, that through expressing our reasoning, you'll be able to reason better about your tool choices as you have to make them. All right, so that's my motivate. That's what I'm trying to motivate. And then John will give you the specifics of the tooling itself. All right, so in our development environment, we use Vagrant and Ansible. Why do we do that? Because it's really easy to onboard external help. Okay, we can take a developer, we set them down, and we say Vagrant up after they pull a repo, and stuff is supposed to work. Okay, we're still working on this. So I'll, truth in advertising, because we're onboarding Derek, and yeah, I bet his life sucks right now. All right. <laughs> Um, part of what we do is um, we run a contract shop. So we will put PHP developers in a place where PHP developers are needed. So we need to be able to put those people into a project and get them going quickly because our customer doesn't want to pay them to sit around for two weeks while they get their development environment spun up, right? That's expensive. And we're expensive. We're not, you know, the, the $50 an hour people. We're, we're really, yeah, it's embarrassing. Okay, so um, part of what we do also is we build teams for companies. So for instance, I've gone in as an executive, I've, I've sat as an interim CTO, and my entire job was to hire my replacement and the team to replace me, and Chelsea in this case, so that that company could continue to grow and function. So typically what we're coming into is a mess where a bunch of people got fired or whatever. So you can imagine that when you have a personal mess like that, imagine what the technology looks like, right? What is that, Conway's Law? Your systems are going to look like, you know, your culture, I think is what it is, right? So um, disposability um, of Vagrant leads to more innovation, better innovation um, and quicker cycles. 
So what does that mean? Well, if you're using Vagrant in your development environment and you want to, say, upgrade from Ubuntu 1404 to 1604, you can just try that. And if it doesn't work, you just throw it away, Vagrant up, and you go back to work. So because you're taking less risk, you're willing to take more risks. And, those more, and so if you can throw 100 things up against the wall and two of them stick, you're winning. But if you can only throw three things up against the wall, you're probably not even going to bother because the likelihood of success is really low. So th that disposability, that ability to cycle and innovate quickly is another reason um, for why we're picking the whole Vagrant Ansible thing. So now why Ansible? Well, DevOps, right? Infrastructure as code. Of course, you know, that's been talked about over and over again. But essentially what that means is um, uh, through a YAML file, I can create an item potent infrastructure. That means that I can run Ansible over and over again and not mess anything up. A lot of people, like for instance Homestead, uses the bash provider in, in Vagrant. And so what that means is you Vagrant up, and God help you if you say Vagrant provision, because you don't know what's going to happen. It's going to change things and you're not going to know how. It's, it's non-deterministic. Okay, because the bash provider is not item potent. And so what that means is if you change a bunch of things, then you realize you've made a mistake. You just can't say Vagrant provision and kind of get back to the same state you want to be in. You've actually got to Vagrant destroy and then Vagrant up again, which means you could lose work if, you've, if the focus was on the runtime and not necessarily on the code. So that item potency was really important for us. Of all of the things, Chef, Puppet, An Ansible, Salt, CF Engine, God help me, who has heard of CF Engine? Did you know that was the first one? It will make you cry. I'm not smart enough to know what promise theory is. And so I look at, um, you know, like EVE Online there, if any of you all are gamers. That's the learning curve for EVE Online. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the learning curve for CF Engine. What we wanted was the lowest possible learning curve. We don't need all the fancy schmancy stuff. We just need our developers to get to work in a hurry. And we want that in an unimpotent way. And like I mentioned, it's in YAML. And most people these days, they can grok YAML. And if you've never encountered YAML, you can read it pretty fast, you can write it, and then you get really angry because you have no idea why that white space character at the end is, you actually you don't have any idea that the white space character at the end is totally hosing you. And so you learn that lesson and then you learn to actually run it through a YAML, uh, a YAML editor and you're like, oh, okay, and you fix it. So once that's, you know, learning, so again, low learning curve. So um, again, note the reasoning is about business outcomes in this case, it's not the coolest tech. The coolest tech is not Ansible, the coolest tech today is Docker, right? And you notice I haven't said Kubernetes yet. Well, no, I just said Kubernetes. All right, so I'm not talking about the coolest tech. I'm talking about the thing that gets the job done for the customer. You know, the people that sign our paychecks. Yeah, so, um, or in your case, the people you work for, you know, those people that sign your paychecks, right? So that's kind of a really important outcome in our, in our case. So why Travis CI? In this case, it's build as code. Remember a minute ago with Ansible, we were talking about infrastructure as code, right? That's actually checked in. And anybody can change it. And if Shaquille changes it, and he pushes that through a PR, I'm going to go, oh, yeah, hey, man, that's a great idea. We should do more of that. Or um, I don't think that's the outcome you want because that's going to have this side effect, right? And I, as the infrastructure expert, would be able to then share my knowledge with Shaquille because of that pull request. Shaquille is sharing his knowledge of this is the thing I need in the infrastructure as a developer through that pull request. Good things are happening. Through the build with Travis, the same thing is happening. I need the build to change this way, everybody on my team, because... Travis.yaml is just a file that sits right there in your repo. It's under source control. And part of what DevOps means to me is all the awesome, all of the awesome that is the developer workflow, source control, pull requests, testing, all those things are actually applied to infrastructure because the infrastructure is actually source code. And now the build is actually source code, unlike Jenkins. <coughs> oh. And again, it has that low learning curve. So instead of the whole EVE Online thing like Jenkins, um, you've got you know, that nice World of Warcraft you know, kind of situation going there. All right. It's also uh, got a fairly decent security paradigm to get started. I mean, is it the gold standard? No. Amazon is not using Travis CI for keeping its secrets. But it does let you encrypt things so that you can do a better job of keeping things secret. And it gets you down the path of starting uh, to think about those those um, aspects of security. And there's our friend YAML again, right? Um, I love Keanu Reeves. <laughs> so again, note the tool supports the core sets of values. It's simple. We're using a consistent technology, right? We're, we've chosen YAML again because now somebody just needs to know YAML once and they get two things for free. Woot. Um, and again, infrastructure and build are both code. So why S3? Well, S3 is actually simple storage solution. Did you know the, notice the first word? Remember those quotes about simple? Yeah, all right. So again, core values. 
No need to dedicate an artifact. Uh, no, need for, no, ah, no need for a dedicated artifact store. You can use Artifactory or um, what's the other one? That, uh, Nexus. Yeah. So uh, Artifactory or Nexus. And they have a lot of really great features, right? They solve problems. But you've got you to learn how to run them and all that. Do you need that? Or do you just need a standard naming convention that will get you far enough for now? Well, when we walk into a shit show and we go to unshit it, usually all we need is a standard naming convention. That's it. Yay, all right. Now, if they need more, sure, we'll give them more. But let's start with simple. You know why? Because simple makes money. It doesn't make messes. Already included in the target ecosystem. In other words, we're already deploying to S3. Remember, the whole thing is to get it into Beanstalk. So we're already in AWS. S3 is already available to us. OK. So again, core values, simple. Things are already present in the ecosystem. So we're not going to go use the Azure object store. I don't even remember what it's called right now. Because, ooh, Azure's is better because it has that feature-y thing, you know, and tools. And no, 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 no. We're going to use the thing that's right there in front of us because it's simple. All right, Elastic Beanstalk. Again, why Elastic Beanstalk? It's simple. See a theme. <laughs> it's developer-focused. Now, think about that. I'm the operations guy, right? My entire world is centered around being bored. I hate excitement because excitement means at 3 o'clock in the morning, my phone went off, and my wife rolls over and goes, what? <laughs> that is not the kind of excitement I want in my life. I want boredom, right? So I want to go to work and solve interesting problems, not go to work dragging my ass in after having been in up at 3 o'clock in the morning going, why is it broken? Just let me go back to sleep. All right. It's configuration driven. There's that infrastructure as code thing again, right? So you go, so in its simplest form, you can go into the Amazon um, GUI, the console, and you can check a few boxes and you can get just the PHP environment you want. And you never, ever touch the machines. You just push the go button and whoop, there's Apache with PHP on it. You don't even care it's Apache. It's actually Apache with mod PHP. I hate that. It's on Amazon Linux. I hate that too. I have opinions. But you know what? My biggest opinion, the one that I hold most dear, is it's simple. And you get platform as a service, but in case you need it, like me, in case you just can't stand not to touch it, you still have IAS control. In other words, I can go shell into those machines if I want to and poke around. And I have. And the reason that I did was to go figure out what I was supposed to install with Ansible so that our development environment had as close a possible parity to what we were deploying to. So when we first started this, we were doing Nginx and FPM, but we were deploying to Apache Mod PHP. You can imagine at some point that we're going to have a problem. We're going to go, I don't know why that's happening. Let's, hey, let's try this in production to see what happens. Yeah. So anybody hearing bad ideas there? Right. So we wanted to, to do parity. So John says to me, fix that. And I say, yes, sir. So really what he said was rub some DevOps on it. <laughs> And then the other thing that Elastic Beanstalk comes with is auto-scaling. Because while it is really nice to say, wow, we need to scale, check, nice problem to have. Being up at 3 o'clock in the morning, crying, why doesn't this work? Sucks. So instead, we sleep through the night. We had a customer who, two years ago, their site went down on Black Friday. They're a retail shop. And did not come back for three days? Six days. Six days. Sucks to be them. Right. They managed to stay in business, hire us, and the three of us who were on call that night slept through the night. Boredom achieved. Why? I think during Black Friday, actually, Elastic Beanstalk launched one more web server for us and then tore it down after it didn't need it anymore. And we didn't know until a couple days later when we were like, I wonder what actually happened. Now, do you think that was a happy customer? I can tell you who was happier than a customer. Me. I was asleep. <laughs> All right. And finally, Elastic Beanstalk has A-B deployments built in. And that's a really big deal for John. He really, that's a, that's a core value of his. And it's really nice because you deploy B, every, all the traffic goes to B. And then you go, oh, no, it's broken. You just go back to A. You know, and that's built into Beanstalk. Life is good. So you know that, that deploy where you, it's like a death march? You start at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday because, you know, I have a three-hour maintenance window, and we're going to be done in 30 minutes. And six hours later, you're like, why does it work? I just want to go play with my children. And you, nobody knows. And you can't. You got to fight forward because you got no place to go backwards. Nope. Beanstalk. All right. So simple. It's that, you know, 
You keep using that word. You know, it's like, you know, you killed my father. Prepare to die. I don't think that means what you think it means. Um, so why this tool chain? Our customers often don't have a tech team when we arrive. And sometimes they don't want one. Um, they want that, you know, just some, some dude that can randomly do the things to the things. All right, Beanstalk gives them that. It's developer-focused tools, right? Developers provide value. Operations people provide attitude and anger. All right, so yeah, we make things go, but the things that we make go are your things. This, so the simpler that we can make it, the more we can move on to becoming developers of solutions of our own. You know, glue, glue code, things of that nature. Developer focused means everything is code. So we go back to that infrastructure is code, build is code. These are again our core values because you guys have a far better workflow than any operations person ever, I promise. And I've met literally tens of thousands of operations people. So I can style myself a bit of an expert here. You people sitting in this room have better workflows than those tens of thousands of people, I promise. And if you come to Austin DevOps, they will admit this to you. Am I right? <laughs> so powerful workflows of commit, test, push, etc. those are effective for the maintenance of infrastructure as well. Okay, so we're winning by taking what you've done and honed over the years and just applying it to our problem too. So now that we've motivated the whys of those tools, what's mo what, what drove us to pick that particular set of tools, a technical demonstration. John's going to do this for you. Uh, if you want to take a picture of this, um, actually. I posted to the uh, channel too. Oh, great. Okay. Um, that blog post on the top is what John's going to show you. So, just like if you were here for the paper trail thing I did, we created a blog post so that you could go and do it yourself if you want to. And then the one below that is um, just some directions on how to install Vagrant if you've never monkeyed with Vagrant before. So, John Cunningham, he is the founder of Victory CTO. How many of you guys use Pick a Prof to choose your college classes back in the day? Go, raise your hand. He was the founder. One of two guys that started PickaProf, and then it became my to you. All right, so, um, and then uh, it's got some imaging process, image processing, mailbox money things going on, yada, yada, yada. He's a serial entrepreneur, but really today what he is, he's going to show off, he's a hacker. Not the, this kind of hacker, black hack hacker, right? He's, he's you know, the, does it work? Ooh, now it works. Yeah, so that kind of hacker. Um, and he's also been a DBA. So um, he's going to show you guys how the tool chain actually fits together soup to nuts. And with that, I'm going to sit down and give over to John. So if you. All right, is it working? Uh-oh. All right, so first challenge is gonna be connecting the video because this is the first time I've ever used this dongle. So let's see if we can be successful with that one. And if not, I have a backup. Yay, all right. Um, and the second one is gonna be making sure that everything looks right from the in the video because it was different resolution earlier. All right, so yeah, Boyd said my name's John, John Cunningham. I'm one of the founders of Victory. Uh, and um, he asked, he said to me, hey, can you come give like a tech talk on the details of how we actually put this, this Laravel Travis, you know, build pipeline together and, and Elastic Beanstalk and, and everything else. And I said, sure. Uh, I don't do this a whole lot. I don't give a lot of tech talks on this stuff, and I don't know how detailed everybody wants it to get. So we have a blog post that I think is really detailed as far as uh, the actual Laravel, everything from the development environment through running it through Travis, through putting it onto Beanstalk. There are some very big um, things that are kind of left out, and I noted in there why they're left out, because they're kind of outside the scope of the talk in general. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as, as we go through this, please, you know, raise your hand, yell out, tell me if there's something you want me to go a little deeper into, something you want me to stop talking about because I'm talking too much. Um, Boyd told me I should take an hour doing this. I don't know how that's humanly possible because I, I don't think it's an hour's worth of stuff, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go as we go. So 
to start off, Laravel. How many of you guys have any experience with Laravel, played around with it or anything? Okay, awesome, good group. So I, I really like Laravel, and I've been, I've been building companies, I've been architecting systems in PHP, almost exclusively in PHP since 1996 or seven, whenever, P, like early, early days of PHP, I think it was like 3.5 or something like that. Um, and I've been through nearly every of the um, frameworks that's out there that, that had any kind of decent traction. And Laravel is the best one I found that kind of solves all the problems that a framework should solve without trying to solve all of your worldly problems. Because I don't want to have to code to your standards. I want to code to my standards. And I want to, I want to raise myself up in that way. I, I can do that with Laravel. Um, so I'm going to touch real quick on the development environment. Uh, so yeah, was, I'm, I'm not just going to read the blog post to you, I promise. I'm just using it as my, as my footnotes as I go through. Um, this example, so there is actually a code base that is linked to this that is uh, um, open on GitHub. You're welcome to grab it. You're welcome to uh, fork it. You're welcome to mess with it. It has those encrypted keys in it that you won't be able to do anything with, which is wonderful because I can check it all into the code base and it all just flows on through. Um, and this one is running on Homestead. It's running on Homestead built into the code base, not Homestead installed differently. So um, Homestead, for anyone who doesn't know, is a, a swizzling of Vagrant designed explicitly to work with Laravel. And they extrapolate some of the, uh, some of the options into a YAML file, which kind of makes it a little bit easier when you're first getting started to go in and say, oh, I want it to be on this IP address, and I want it to do this. Um, it's running on, I think, Ubuntu 16.04, the most current version of it is. And so therefore, we're not going to have perfect parity with the Elastic Beanstalk environment, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and I will tell you right now that if you download this thing and you go and you vagrant up, it's going to error on you and you're going to be like, damn it, John, why did that happen? That's one of the problems with the shell provider in... Uh, in Vagrant. The, um, at one point on the way, one of the commands in the shell provider is to do an app get update and app get upgrade. And that now, like as of a couple days ago, has some interactive requests in it and that will make uh, Vagrant crap out. So if you download this and you go in and you try it, Vagrant up, then get into the machine, do the app get upgrade and update yourself, come out and then do Vagrant provision. It'll finish out and it'll work like a charm. Um, Environmental parity is very important because otherwise I wouldn't have had to have said that last footnote, which would have been very annoying. So this is also designed branch management to be using kind of a Git flow standard. I'm not going to get any deeper into that. Um, all right, so Laravel, why Laravel? We touched on that a little bit. Um, now, why Beanstalk? And I think uh, Boyd talked about this as well, but I just want to expand on a couple of things that he said. One of the... Um, one of the, the groups that we put onto a, a Beanstalk environment, and it was, it was before we upgraded their code to a more recent, uh, more modern kind of framework like Laravel, not only were, would the site go down every once in a while, maybe once every couple of days for 10, 20 minutes for absolutely no reason anyone could tell, um, but it would get attacked pretty frequently. This is a, a decently sized website, seven, eight million users per month that come through, each one of them hitting you know, 10, 20 pages. So trying to identify exactly what's going on, especially in this chaotic environment that we had, is not a terribly easy thing. So the site would just crash. And, um, and the attacks that came in were on some specific pages that had particularly long uh, load times and, and that sort of thing. In, once we wrapped a warm blanket of Elastic Beanstalk around this code base, before we even got in and started, and started building anything new, I would get an alarm that the site went down. An alarm takes five minutes before it gets to me. It takes me about three minutes from there to get back to my computer. By the time I got back there, site was back up. Because uh, the issue that came in would take down all of the nodes, one by one, and then when all of them finally were offline, the attack would stop and then it would bring nodes back in one by one. And that time frame, by the time, by the time I got to the alarm, the site was already fine. And that was on the old code. So I, I've become a really big fan of Elastic Beanstalk. Um, all right, let me get my head back about me as far as the actual tech talk part of this code goes. Um, <coughs> special Laravel things having to do with uh, Elastic Beanstalk. That's kind of a, another important point to touch on here. So if you've played around with Laravel, you know you can store files locally, you can run your sessions off the files locally, you can do all kinds of things like that, especially in your development environment. There's some uh, specific pieces in here that I went into 
and I'm just going to go off to there. There's some specific, specific pointers I put in towards the end of the article, I think, about things not to do if you're going to take this out to Beanstalk. And, and it has to do entirely with how the environment's handled, the fact that servers are cattle, not pets, and you shouldn't expect them to last longer than a user session at any given point in time. Um, and, uh, um, but apart from that, the nice thing is, there's very little issue, there's very little special things you have to do. Like if you go and try to take a Laravel environment and run it in Google App Engine or something like that, there are some, uh, there are some um, composer packages that people have put together that allege that they can kind of just make that run super easy and then you can run an App Engine and that's really neat. I have never successfully gotten one of those to work. Uh, and when it comes to Beanstalk, you're running on just a standard old um, Amazon Linux server. You can mess with the environment a little bit, um, and it allows you to get, you know, to have to do minimal things to be able to run up there. All right, let me see here. So let's do a little bit demonstration side of this and jump back into the hows and wins. Uh, this made more sense being zoomed up when my before I hooked in here. All right. So um, you guys can all see that all right? This is the Travis YAML file. This goes in the base level of your code base. This tells Travis what to do in order to test your code and deploy your code. And the entirety of everything you need to do in order to do that is in this 86 lines. And I probably have been using more spaces than I need to. Could maybe cut that down a little bit. Um, the, the blog post goes like section by section and very specifically pulls out what every single line does. I'm going to be a little broader than that uh, in order to get onto a point where I'm not actually taking an entire hour of your time. But what it comes down to is this first bit kind of defines what the environment is you're going to be running on. Uh, this next bit defines what's happening in order to get everything set up. And if you've used Laravel and played with it, you're going to recognize things like the .env and artisan commands that are in there and everything else. Uh, I have, we have another project that uh, uses Elasticsearch quite a bit. And, and we're really big fans of Elasticsearch, not only as a searching engine, a search engine, but also as just a, a super fast denormalized front end facing cache. Uh, and I can, I can do a whole talk just on that because it's, it's, it enables you to get site speed just insanely fast. Um, but to properly test, you have to have data because the site's not going to work without any data in it. So one of, one of these builds we have actually will reach into an S3 bucket that we have set up. It, takes, it uses secret keys that are encrypted and sent into Travis in this YAML file. It hooks into this uh, Elastic Beanstalk, I'm sorry, S3 bucket and grabs some JSON files of known data sets and actually loads them into a running Elasticsearch server on the Travis environment. All this happens in about, like from start to, from start to deployment, it's about six minutes. That's loading stuff in the database, loading stuff in Elasticsearch, installing everything from Composer, um, getting the environment all set up, running all of the tests, and then, coming, and then actually zipping up an archive and deploying it to Beanstalk. Uh, one of the other nice things is by running Composer in here, uh, obviously the, in the code base you never want to store all your vendor files inside of, inside of the code base because bad practice, uh, but the, the Composer lock file will handle making sure that's up to date for you. When we create the artifact at the bottom of this file, it has all of the vendor packages already built into it. Into it. We're not going to send it out to the server and have it then built over there. The artifact is exactly everything that it needed to be at the moment that it leaves this environment. Um, any questions so far? No? All right. Going too fast, too slow? All right. Um, this, is, this is the next section. This, this is the testing script section, and we hijacked it a little bit for uh, the installation of Elasticsearch. We're very picky about the specific version we're using to make sure we have version parity with what we're using in AWS. And actually, we've been able to use the AWS uh, Elasticsearch service, which is fantastic. It's a little less expensive than using Elastic Coes, and it's really easy to mess around with. Um, they really improved it in the last like six months, which I was really happy to see because when it first came up, it wasn't all that good. Uh, but in here, we, um, we purge out Elasticsearch that may have been there. We install the specific version we want. We drop in the base indices. I don't have anything in them here, so you're not going to see any loading files or anything like that. We migrate. We set up our, uh, our JavaScript and CSS with the NPM run production. Now your environment is complete. 
This is, and if you run Travis in debug mode, and I'll show you this stuff in a second, you, you can SSH into the server and you can, you know, curl locally and pull ex your, your actual running website there on Travis, which obviously you need if you're going to be able to be testing it. Uh, then we have a couple fun test things in here. PHPMD is a service that I hate and I constantly use because it yells at me about cyclometric complexity and, and functions that are too long and functions that are too complex and classes that are too complex. And when you get in one of those you know, runs and you've got really great logic going, you think you're really smart about it, and then this thing yells at you and you can't push up to back to a branch and it makes me angry, but it makes the code clean. Um, all right, here, Slack notifications. It, Travis can notify by all kinds of different means, and there's a link to all the notification stuff in the blog post. Uh, I like Slack. Slack's nice and easy. And um, it will, and this one is giving it to me, deploy, fail, whatever. So now, moving on to the actual deploy setup. Um, we clean out some files. We create the artifact. And, um, and it's named based on the commit as well as on the, um, uh, as well as the hash, I believe, are both in there. Um, and zip it up. This defines that we're only going to um, run this on master and staging branch and not care about any other branches. And then this is the deploy. Again, this is everything that you need to just push to Git and have it show up on production with no, no in-between, no, no issues, as long as everything passes and, and that kind of thing. Uh, this is the, um, Boyd had mentioned the encrypted bits here. So this massive string is my AWS uh, access token, and, and the one below it is the secret, or the key in the secret, that are encrypted by Travis. They're locked to this particular code base and I can freely put them in here and, and there's no way you could use it unless I actually let you into my GitHub uh, and let you push into that. But any developer who is pushing, who does have access to that GitHub, they will work perfectly fine. Um, and that's really it. This is, there's two providers in here, one for staging and another one for master. So um, before I move on to actually showing things off and, and whatnot, any, any other questions? Yes, Mr. Hanville. It's building in a Travis container, and there is, and this is another another pain point, and I go into this in the earlier section, of, in the kind of beginning section of the blog when talking about parity. Travis likes Ubuntu. It doesn't mean that you can't set up other environments with it. Travis likes Ubuntu. Homestead is Ubuntu uh, just by default, so you have parity from there to there. But when you go up into Beanstalk, you're moving from Ubuntu into AWS Linux. You're moving from Nginx into Apache. You're moving from PHP FPM into mod PHP. There's a lack of parity there. And we've actually seen people get bit because they will update their homestead and move to, like a developer on his own, will update, update his homestead, move from PHP 7.1 to 7.2, and then do a composer update. And that means all of the, uh, all the dependencies change, and all of a sudden all the packages that they install change, and then all the locks change, and then they try to send it back out, and it'll make it all the way to a development environment before it crashes and doesn't work. So uh, but to, when I say to a development environment, in, in for this client, there is a develop, staging, and production. So the developers can commit to the develop environment and show each other things and not just be on their local Vagrant. Uh, and that's, that's one of the pain points I want to I fix. And this is we've been working on a, uh, our, our own Vagrant with Ansible that is as close to parity with, uh, with AWS Beanstalk as, as can be had. <coughs> so... Um, Starting off, here I am inside of the uh, directory for this project. Um, I'm going to Vagrant up. Um, and this will happen quickly because I've already brought this machine up before, obviously. Uh, on a normal first time Vagrant up for this, 15 minutes maybe, depending on your, the, your connection speed to get all of your, all the packages updated and downloaded and everything else. Um, and I have... Let's see. Do, 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 do. No, don't give me that. There we go. All right, we're up. And this is, let's do this. So this is the site for it. Now, um, 
one of the things I did really like about Homestead, and this was the first time I, in, in, in using Vagrant, the first time I got introduced to this idea, is, is Homestead will create within Vagrant a second network connection that's not just the one that's piped through from localhost. So you can have different IP addresses for each project that you work on. And if you're like me, and you have at any given point in time, 10 or 15 different code bases on your laptop, and uh, and you want to be able to quickly switch between them without remembering which port they were pointing to, you can use your Etsy host file to just point to the specific IP address, and it's magical. So uh, this, is the, this is the test site that we have set up. It is a plain Jane Laravel setup. There's a couple extra pieces in it that are just standard pieces that we use a whole lot. This down here is something called debug bar. Um, Warville Debug Bar, it's a really handy little tool, especially if you are obsessed with site speed like I am, because you can put you can put breakpoints and measurement points in your code, and you can turn this thing on and off, and you can turn it on in a staging environment and see what's going on there, and it'll tell you what's taking a long time, why it's taking a long time, well, it's up to you to figure out why it's taking a long time, but it'll tell you what's taking a long time, and you can figure out why it's taking a long time, and then put breakpoints in to figure, to find, to fine tune the speed of things. Uh, but aside from that, the um, Elasticsearch connection packages that we particularly like, and PHPMD, um, PHPMD, I think that's the only stuff that was really added into this code base. So other than that, it's very plain Jane. Uh, and for purpose of demonstration, so we have, this is the site on Elastic Beanstalk. And you can see here, it works very much the same way. I made an account on it earlier so I can log in, and I'm logged in now, neat. Uh, now, let's go change a little code and see things change. So I queued this up. Uh, instead of having the app name in the top left corner, which is up here, we're going to swap that out for a logo. And then we go over to GitHub. You can see my changes. Commit, push. If anybody's wondering if I give my boss shit for using a GUI for Git, I do. That's fine. I don't care. Um, it makes for a better presentation. Uh, all right, so uh, jumping over a little bit, and here's where I'll talk about Travis, and then I'll talk about um, Elastic Beanstalk a little bit as we as we watch the pipeline move its way through. So. This is, uh, this is Travis CI. If you um, have never played with Travis CI, I highly encourage it. They give it away for free for open source projects, so you can make your own little open source code base and go mess around with it some. Uh, and this is the build that we just turned on. Uh, and I'm going to um, shrink that down a little bit. We got lucky because we have, we have people working right now, and if, uh, if too many of them were throwing builds at the same time, we'd all have to sit here and wait for it to start spinning up. Um, that is right, the, the, the pricing of Travis CI is essentially how many build containers you can run at a time. Yeah, how many simultaneous. Yeah. So, uh, the, and, it's, and it, it's, not, it's not terribly expensive, but it's also not terribly cheap. So it's one of those, it's, it's fully, I, I found it to be fully worth it for, for our work especially. Um, so the, this, will, this will spin up and run as, as we're sitting here watching it, but you can see the last time, so I'll show you some other fun stuff here. Build history. This, in the process of, you can see all my great commit names here, like erg. Um, but in the process of putting this thing together, I ran 27 builds through. And um, as I was just making sure the code base worked the way I wanted it to, and it was something you guys could use and, and take on from there. And going all the way back to the bottom, it's, you know, merge request number one, did not build. Absolutely no, n no surprise there. If we go back and look at the history of it, I'd be willing to bet it failed relatively quickly. Um, yeah, so it was having trouble. I don't think I'm seeing the full log yet. Yeah, there we go. Failed to deploy. So this thing had a problem because I hadn't yet finished setting up all the stuff on the Beanstalk side and didn't have the keys in the right place. So a little bit of trial and error in the process of, of pulling it up and putting it together. I found these... Um, I found the, um, the logs in Travis to be impeccably useful. And when I have a developer come back to me and say, I don't know why my build's failing. I say, did you, did you look at the log? Because it tells you very directly exactly what's happening. Um, 
And the other really nice thing that you can see if I look at a pass build is there's this great debug build button. I'm not going to run it right now because, you know, I don't want to wait for the five minutes for it to spool the thing up. But basically what it does is it runs through the end of the part where it creates the environment, and then it'll throw right into the log a, uh, an SSH string. And you just take that, you drop it in your terminal, and you're on the box. And you can mess around with anything you need to, figure out exactly why it's failing, uh, because maybe it's working perfectly for you in your development environment, and you have no idea why, right? So we're now two minutes into this logo swap build, and I'll, I'll give you the, the quick rundown of, of the stuff that's going on here. Um, this is the setting the environment up area, right? And this is setting up uh, PHP 7.1. Um, then composer self-update, that's just updating composer. Um, test the PHP version. This is the commands I was showing you earlier where it is creating the Homestead database copying the Travis environmental file over, you know, yada, 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 on, on down we go. Uh, this is the, and because I put the Elasticsearch stuff into the testing environment area, I'm seeing uh, this come up here in green and say, this command exit with the zero. Yay. It, it happened perfectly fine. This next command, you know, exit with the zero. So we're passing all of our tests. Uh, this was to give Elasticsearch a, like, up to 30 seconds to actually get totally spun up and running. And then we do our migration. It's running NPM run production. That produces really ugly logs for a little bit. This is a couple of really simple tests that are coming out of Laravel. One of the cool things about this setup also is you can use all of the Laravel testing stuff right out of the box. You don't need to, you don't need to make your test special just for Beanstalk. You don't need to make them special just for Travis. You can, you can follow along in the Laravel documentation on how to write tests their way and, and works perfectly. Um, that be that simple thing again, right? Yes. No, I'm, I, I'm, the, I'm the guy who doesn't customize anything about his laptop because I like to be able to jump on somebody else's and not feel like I'm in, in a weird place. Right, so I, I like stuff, it, it sounds weird because I've been a technologist and a geek for my entire life, but I, I like stuff to, I like to learn how the system works rather than try to bend the system to work for me. Um, good old code coverage. It said code coverage test exit with a zero, installing dependencies, done, your build exit with a zero. Now this is over on the Beanstalk page, I hope I didn't miss it. Uh, let's see, recent events, this is not, the build, so this should be on its way out right now. Um, so I'm gonna make you guys watch me look for things. That's the most recent version. We exit it with the zero. Is this the same one we have? New stuff, there it is. And it is, I did miss it. I want you guys to actually see it spin. Um, but see here we have running most recent version, Warville blank staging, same of the repo. That's the hash. That's the date, UTC. If you, want, if you need to go and try to track down a particular artifact, having those pieces of information makes it really easy to find it. It'll work in any system. You don't need to have a special search capability. You go to the page that shows all the different versions of the environment that are there, and you do a command F, nice and simple. Uh, and then to show that we were actually able to do what we said, Do that correctly. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. I'm not sure this has actually gone out. All right. Or maybe I didn't save the file. Huh. All right, we'll move it on. Oh, see? Aha, uh -huh. it's not the one that's up there. Let's see if something happened. Sample. See, now it's going out. I didn't miss it. Yay, I didn't miss it. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was like, okay, I did this like nine times earlier today, and now it, it suddenly fails on me. So Travis has taken this and has pushed it out to Beanstalk. It has dropped it, it has dropped the zip into an S3 file. Um, into an S3 bucket. There's one bucket you get for your entire region for uh, any Elastic Beanstalk things that you're doing. So it's kind of an important thing to remember if you're running like 15 different or 15 or 20 different um, uh, environments, 
Um, and, and in Beanstalk application, you have one application and then within an application you have multiple environments. And I'll show you some of that in a second here on the, on the command screen. Um, but all of those different files are going to go into one single S3 bucket, which is fine because Beanstalk extrapolates that for you and only lets you push an artifact for a given environment to that environment. You, you can't accidentally swap them back and forth. So uh, that zip file got moved out to the server. It was unzipped. It was dropped into a container. It was uh, some EB extensions were run, and I'll show you some EB extensions in a minute. The, those are things that customize the server. They're kind of like a, a similar to a shell provider, basically. Um, not nearly as fancy as Ansible or, or anything else like that. Uh, so some EB extensions were run. Everything tested fine on the Beanstalk side, meaning none of the EB extension code failed, the zip came down successfully, it matched the hash, and then those two, um, those two containers were swapped. And there was zero interruption to the front end. Um, when we've done, as I think the most pushes we've done in a day for one client on a Beanstalk environment was like 32. Uh, and that was because there was just a lot of, and it's production on a 7 million user a month system. And that's because, you know, oh, oh the CEO thought they liked that color. No, they really like that color. And, and let's just go back and forth a little bit, right? Um, so now to actually show, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quit GitHub so Boyd doesn't make fun of me anymore. Um, hey, there we go. That's the new logo that we put in. And... Um, straight on up to production. Now, in this code base, I have staging and master both going to the same single environment because I didn't build two different environments just for the talk. Normally, what I would do is have staging go to a staging environment, master go to a production environment, and every other, uh, every other branch, you know, you usually have a develop environment so that you could merge into the development environment and see that go to the development area. Um, all right, so let's look at Let's look at Beanstalk for a minute. Have any of you guys ever gone in and played around with Beanstalk at all? No. All right. Um, Pete a little bit. All right. So as, as Boyd said, Beanstalk is really great in that it takes several things you would commonly use in manually setting up an environment in AWS, and it just kind of puts a nice little wrapper around all of them to make sure that they, they function well together and they're designed to play well together. Um, so I'll go up to the very top, and this is, you know, this is Victory's own account. We mess around in it a lot. We also run our own sites out of here, and we run our own sites off of Beanstalk. Um, so there's, you know, you'll see a bunch of different environments in here. Uh, this guy, this is our meetup sample environment. You see up here, this is one of our, um, one of our clients that they've asked us to host their system for them. It's called Fippy. There's a green and a prod. There's oftentimes a green and a blue because in order to do your AB, um, your AB deployment, you can deploy to one environment and then hit that button and swap the URLs in the DNS. Done. Uh, the, the, the place where you should test and validate and make sure you're okay with it has to do with load on the ELB, on the load balancer that's built in if you're using a load balancer because there was a thought about a year ago that ELBs needed to warm up and so if you suddenly take a thousand simultaneous users and flip them onto a new ELB, it may, not, it may not be prepared for it. So for that reason, oftentimes you just stick with deploying to the same environment if you're confident in your deploys, but you have the last known good on the other environment and if something goes sideways, you can just swap without even having to think twice about it. Um, here's our environment that we're using for this sample. Now when I say environment, what do I mean? All right, let's look at the configuration. I'm not going to walk you through actually building an Elastic Beanstalk environment because it takes some time. Uh, not messing with the parameters, but literally Amazon takes about 10, 15 minutes to do all the things after you set everything up. But if you go through their tutorial, um, and if you go through the, the action of setting it up, just playing around for fun, make sure after the initial setup screen, instead of just saying, go ahead and create it, hit the more options button. That'll give you this screen, and that's where you can go in and really mess around with things and have fun. So um, what we see here, really quickly, this is the type of instances that we're running. So it's a T1 micro, monitors every five minutes, and the capacity, this is set as load balanced, which means I can turn on auto scaling, but I just set it to a single 
uh, a single node right now. And you can auto scale based on any of these different parameters and whatever is right for your application would be how you would lay that out because everybody's a little bit different. Um, let me get out of this one. For the Laravel minded, this is an interesting place. You get a little bit of stuff for PHP, I'm not gonna bother with that right now. Um, everything that's in that .env file that you use that you're not supposed to check into your code that is how your environment is set up for you to work on locally, you just put in here. And um, I don't have anything in here that's a secret, so I don't care if you guys see it. But, uh, it, and all it does is take all of this stuff and put it into a um, Apache config file that is in, you know, httpd conf.d, it's called aws.config. It just drops all of this stuff in there and it's now part of the PHP environment. So you don't have to try to pass up .env files, you don't have to try to manage your configuration, and you can come in here and change one of these things and it will change in about 15 seconds on your entire stack, no problem, shoot. So for the Travis side of things, um, we deal with that a little bit differently. Um, so if this is my standard .env file for this thing, there's also a .env.travis file that we add in. And, um, the dot and, and part of the Travis build right up here, it copies the .env.travis file over to .env. So in Travis, you're running with the .env style file um, and the, the local thing, but once it goes out to Beanstalk, it's pulling the environmental information out of the Apache environment. Uh, and the nice thing about it is the .env Travis files are really simple uh, and um, you know, the, the database username is always Travis, the password is always empty. You can make the database name whatever you want it to be. That's why I created the, with the MySQL command. Yeah. So MySQL in Travis, is that like a separate container or is it like a, it's in the Ubuntu Linux environment and it's I believe it's within the container. I believe it's within the regular Ubuntu container. It's just for, for Travis, it's just an option um, that, you, that you put in there in your services list. So Travis has a number of, of services you can add in and use. We purposely don't use their Elasticsearch one because we wanna make sure we're keeping parity with, uh, with what we're using in AWS. But for MySQL, it's been fine. Now there've been some changes recently with like the mo most recent version of MySQL that's come out, oh, I think 5.7, they started changing like default character links and some things like that. So it's, that's gonna be a little bit of a pain, but The answer is yes, and it usually works. Uh, <laughs> so your mileage may vary. Yeah. So, for people that aren't familiar with Elasticsearch, even the smallest adopter, at least within Elasticsearch, usually breaks something, which is why we're so anal about Elasticsearch, which is why MySQL has been really stable for many years. So that's why we're a bit more loosey goosey with Elasticsearch. Yeah. Anything else? All right, I'll keep blabbering until you guys tell me to stop. Um, doo, doo, doo. Oh, the the other thing you see the Jorical, or Jorical, Oracle JD, <laughs> JDK eight. That's also a specific one that we put in because of the Elasticsearch version that we're installing. Even though Oracle's now moved to nine in the last as the default in the last couple of weeks. Um, all right. So this is nice. You can go in. You can change it. You can change something now. Uh, and I, I go into more detail on this in the blog. But when we're setting up. Uh, a code base for a production release. Uh, we do all the little Laravel tricks to make everything go as fast as possible. Like we uh, compile the configuration uh, files, we uh, compile the route files, uh, and doing that means that there's some things that may not change and work the way you want it to. So for instance, when this is running on a, um, on a production server, I change an environmental file in here, an environmental variable in here, it may not change instantly on all of the servers because that, that uh, environmental variable is actually compiled into the uh, config list in Laravel. And so at that point, I have the choice of either making all the servers reboot, which I can do, and it's not a big deal, or just running another release or even rerunning a release. So as Boyd said, we don't, we don't wanna ever have to get into the servers and, and monkey around in there if we can avoid it. Um, the environments that we tend to set up 
or actually lock out external access completely uh, to, um, to the machines. And if we need to get into them, we can turn on a bastion machine uh, that, will, that will sit at the, in a special security group that has nothing else in it except for that bastion machine, machine that can reach in. Yeah. Ba am I saying this wrong? Bas bastion. Bastion. Yeah. A, a bridge. Right, so it's so, and then you do, uh, and then you do SSH key tunneling, which um, will take hours to learn, or you can just like copy paste the one line and, and hang on to it. Um, but the, and you you tunnel your key all the way through from one to the to the last one, so you don't ever actually leave your key on the Bastion server. Um, you just hop through it. Uh, Yeah, and like I, in in a perfect world, and I haven't I haven't successfully done this yet, but I want to build a Slack bot that I can go in and just say, you know, slash Bastion client name, and it'll launch the machine, and then when I'm done, tell it I'm done and, and tear the machine back down, because I don't I don't personally I mean Bastions are generally like tinies and micros, and all they have to do is handle holding a connection in between. I'd rather they not even exist unless there's some reason that I need to be using them. So the security group is all set up there, the subnet is all set up, but if nothing's in it, then there's no port 22 coming in. This also avoids, um, I don't know if you guys have ever had the pain point of going in, of, of setting up some stuff in AWS and you wanna go in and play with it, and so you go in and you put your IP address in the security group as being allowed in from your home, cool. And then you wanna show it to somebody else and you're like, oh crap. And what's your IP address? Let me go in my account and add this thing in and everything else. It's, you avoid all of that by being able to just hook in from a bastion. And if you like to take vacations, then being able to do that is really handy. Um, looking over this stuff really quick, I mean, if you've ever set up with or played with, um, you know, a, a production level, uh, no single point of failure style, um, environment for public consumption, then things like load balancers and um, and multiple servers and everything else are kind of things you've played with before. If you're like me and Boyd, you spent time in a data center that's 55 degrees actually hand setting up load balancers and firewalls and everything else. And it's a pain and it's horrible. But with, with this setup going from, to, to give you an idea, without any, without any significant issue while sitting in front of the television with my wife watching stupid television shows on Netflix. This week, I've set up four environments using this kind of formula w without any issue, without any trouble. And, and they, have, they can have uh, web application firewalls on them and they have elastic load balancers on them and the ports are all locked off correctly and, the, um, and they're, they're load balanced and they're set up for auto scaling. And as soon as I'm done with them, they could take 10,000 users suddenly running in the door. When, uh, when, we tested, when we tested some of these systems for, um, for one of our clients as we, as we went up, this was the one that had the, the issue with uh, Black Friday a year ago, and then this last Black Friday we all slept very well. Their average traffic um, in any given minute is, you know, on the high end is probably 20, 30 per second active users, right? So we tested it to 800 on the production environment to know that we were gonna be happy with it. And, and the, the pinch point was actually the database because uh, that's, and, and using, I'm not gonna go into the, the Elasticsearch thing, but part of the reason the pinch point was the database is everything was cached off in Elasticsearch. But the, uh, the, the database could not handle more than 800 simultaneous users. Um, so we decided that was acceptable and we all went to bed. And then it just rolled out just fine. No, no issues on, on Black Friday. Um, has some other nice features. You can get notifications when things change, you know. Um, managed updates, monitoring, yada, yada, yada. So uh, this is a fun, this is one last part to kind of touch on database. Me personally, I never actually, you can actually set up the database in your Elastic Beanstalk as part of set, turning Elastic Beanstalk up as far as, as part of going through the configuration. So it's not just the web servers and the load balancers, but you can include the database on there. But I'm the kind of paranoid guy who doesn't like to do that because 
Um, if I do something stupid and I kill that environment, then the database is gone and it's gone forever. And I also like to have multiple environments share one database so I can have like a develop and staging that are sharing some backend infrastructure so I can see what's going on. So don't cry. Boy, to, to clarify, all of your um, auto backups are gone, yes. right? Yes. But a snapshot that you take manually remains. Correct, yes. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Make sure you're manually snapshotting your RDSs. Yeah. On a cadence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Amazon does not necessarily care. Uh, <laughs> they, they have added some stuff lately, like in RDS, if you go and, and terminate a instance, it does say, we really think you should make one final snapshot before you do that. Do you want us to make one more snapshot? And you say yes, and it makes it for you and then kills the instance off. So they've gotten a little nicer about it, but user friendliness was not their first point. Um, there's some other nice things in here. You can pull logs from the machine directly into the, into the uh, UI here. You can see the current health of the machine, and whenever you run a deploy, you'll see it happening in here. You'll see the machine is saying, you know, up, pending updates and, and that sort of thing, and then back to healthy. I can go in here and um, I can kill this machine, and it'll terminate it, and then it'll detect that there's no machine there, and then the new machine will come back up and take its place, and I don't, I don't care. Um, the... There's some really lightweight monitoring that's just kind of automatically built in to let you know throughput and everything else. We don't have a very heavily used example website right now since I haven't shown it to anyone. Um, you know, you can set up your alarms and, and see the list of events, right? So it's probably going to transition into a state of being really angry. I may have to actually hit the page and see it dead in order to make it angry. Because I may not, there you go. So now, now we're in a severe state because I killed the server. Uh, and once it figures all of that out, it, it'll take it, because I manually killed it, it's gonna sit here and say, okay, well there's no data, but we don't know that for sure. And it's gonna take it probably about, I don't know, a minute, two minutes to realize that there's nothing going on there and then it'll spawn a new machine and, and come back up. So what did, I, what did I not talk about yet that you'd want me to talk about? Or anybody, anybody. Uh, I was looking at Boyd, but yeah. So, oh, like on the server? Yeah. Well, so you still have to tune your application, right? And, um, and, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect solve all for it. I, I'll give you a, a, actually a pretty good example with that. When we were prepping this environment, this thing, if you can't tell, this launch that we did just before the Black Friday thing took a fair amount of my life between August and then. So I, I tend to come back to it often for examples. Um, when we were tuning this environment, I had decided that I wanted to run it on a certain machine size. I think it was like an M4 medium or something like that. And then Boyd came in to rub his DevOps all over things. And after, after about, I don't know, two hours of testing and playing around with it, he said, no, we need to move to this much bigger machine. So I was thinking th more machines that were smaller because that just seemed to kind of make sense. And, and actually, in the previous state that this particular client was in, they would rotate machines about every eight hours. Like I never had a machine in Beanstalk that was older than eight hours. Uh, after we did this launch, the machines actually were, f were I think the oldest one got to 55 days, excuse me, uh, because they, they didn't even need to reboot and, and they honestly didn't even need to scale most of the time because the, the sizing had gotten right. Boyd picked that out because of the memory profile of the application that we'd built and how it was running on those particular machines as well as uh, being able to scale up to four CPUs. And because we didn't realize it at the time, but the machine, the, the code base was actually more CPU bound than we had expected. And paper trail was uh, showing us old end kills, which is, I think was your specific yeah. question, right? Yeah, so we were cleaning old end kills in paper trail. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, it's, it's interesting because for that, for the same code base on the develop and staging environments, 
client decided they didn't want to spend this, that much money because the servers we were using for production are like $200 a month. And they're like, okay, well, develop and stage aren't really looked by a whole lot of people. Let's make them smaller servers. So they made them smaller servers. You know what happened? They crashed a lot because they weren't able to set up to deal with the memory issues. So we built some extra EB extensions that, specific, that were specific to those environments, looked specifically for memory issues, and would restart Apache anytime they saw them. <coughs> a little bit of a hack, but I allowed them to save some cash in the long run. You didn't talk about EB extensions. I, I just realized that, and yeah. All right, so uh, let's see this. So EB extensions. This is, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is an EB extension. Uh, there are, and, and in the blog, there's a link to the documentation. It's the standard AWS documentation, which means it's very boring and highly informative and not going to give you all the examples that you want, but it's a good starting point. Um, so this is a container, this is a set of container commands. And, and in EB extensions, you can do a couple different things. You can make files, you can run things before it goes, before the container is spun up. You can run things inside the container, which is what these are. Uh, and there's another type, I forgot what it was. Um, and what we do here is, you know, shell script commands, very simple. Um, in this case, the first one, I called setup Apache for some stupid reason, but all I'm doing is taking a enable mod deflate.conf and moving it into the Apache configuration area. Uh, for, then we're running migrate, and this, um, and this is kind of fun. This one has leader only, which means Elastic Beanstalk knows the first machine that actually gets the code and runs, and only that machine gets to run that particular command because we don't need to run a migration script nine times. Um, we clear the cache with this guy. These are just running artisan commands. Um, fix, you know, change some permissions around because I was being lazy, and, uh, and boom, it's done. If any of these things fail, you can, you can force, there's a, uh, I, don't, I don't have it in any of these, but there's, a, there's an option you can put on here to force, to not care if it fails effectively. Uh, but if any of these fail, it stops the release and it rolls it back. So you have a protection point in Travis. You have a second protection point in Beanstalk that will, that will ensure that if any of these setup commands fail, it's not going to go live. Um, From a mental model perspective, this is doing exactly what the shell provider is doing if you use a homestead, or what Hesible will do if you were using Hesible. It's just con it's, it's their version of configuration management. It is not out of code, so beware. Yeah. This is a real simple one for to make a file. So this is a files type that creates this file with exactly this text in exactly this location. And this is something that just forces SSL based on reading the ELB headers that come in. I use it everywhere. Um, and this one gets a little bit more complicated in order to set supervisor up, and I included all this stuff in here. Um, there's actually a whole set of shell scripts and templates and everything else that will Make sure that we'll stop supervisor if it's running, install it if it's not installed, put the configuration files in the right place, spin it back up so that you have supervisor running in the background. Because if any of you have ever used a Laravel Q or any other number of things, supervisor is really your friend. So uh, that's any, any questions on EB extensions? This is the, yeah. 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 No, I, I agree with that completely. But for, for the most part, when when trying to when building these things up and and trying to think about the right path, if it's somebody else's problem that they've solved correctly already and in, in the way that they built it, just always aim for that. Um, there's one other. There's a word that John's been using container when he's talking about restock, and y'all are probably mapping that right on the Docker. That's actually not true. In the, in, in the language of Beanstalk, 
Amazon. Yes. So we're actually launching all your machines, but Amazon is looking at that machine as a container. Because remember, Beanstalk is a platform as a service. And so the, it's, it's using the word container much more generically than we think of today because Beanstalk was around before Docker. And not even though it's a really real thing. You know, don't don't uh, get caught up on that. When I was first reading the documentation, I was on the machines going, wait a minute. Where's the thing? You know, where's the Docker data? You know, and yada, yada, yada. It was really maddening. <laughs> All right. You guys got anything else? Why is this interesting? Who cares? Two questions. Yeah. That is a very good question. Beanstalk has documentation that tells you how to build your own AMI, and they ensure you that it is absolutely possible to do. And I can tell you they are liars. Um, <laughs> It, it is, it, there, there is something about, um, and, and I say that, if I was going with, if I was sticking with AWS um, Linux, and effectively what I wanted to do was bake an image that already had all of the crazy stuff that I needed attached to it. That's the pathway that works. If I wanted to go in and do environmental parity and I was going to stick with Homestead as my environment and I wanted to force that parity going upstream, you're in for a really bad, painful ride that you, you don't want to get on that bus. And I tell you that, fortunately, not from personal experience, but from the experience of Chris Casey, one of our, one of, you know, help, helping out and, and bleeding with me going through some of this stuff. Um, sorry, so what was, what was number two? So uh, one, you should, it, if you can't write a database change to be backwards compatible and to be able to run uh, quickly enough without taking the database down, then you need to do a different kind of deployment. And I've been in those situations. So um, you, if, if I was doing that as the way I was doing it, anything that I couldn't write into a migration that would run um, consistently, quickly, and definitively, I would put into either like an artisan script for a one-time run. I'd get the whole system up and running and then figure out how to run that without, if humanly possible, without taking the site down or if I need to, you put up a, sorry, we're in maintenance mode for 10 minutes and, and run it and then come back. Because one thing I found is that if you, yeah, back in the mighty U days, we were dealing with 50 million rows of schedule information and making a tweak to that table could sometimes take a minute, two minutes. Now, making a tweak to that table while 5,000 people are actively using it, will destroy your life. So we would, we, would actually, we would actually put the site into maintenance mode, make the changes, and then come back out. And to make it even more painful, we had a master master set up on the database. So I'm, you know what, I'm gonna stop. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. So the- If you know more about that, ask me, because I, I was the one who did all that. So I, I can give you the, all the dirty news. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, was, it was impressive and fun stuff, but again, I'm gonna stop. Um, so as far as the multi, you know, multi-million rows, what I found is that even with the multi-million row table, if you are like, if you're doing something that's entirely backwards compatible, like you're just adding a field, it still tends to run pretty quick. Um, and, and that also comes down to how you're managing your database, right? Um, I've also used migrations to do other things that maybe it wasn't initially intended to do. Like I've had migrations run a script that updates something in Elasticsearch because I like the fact that it's in linear parity with the release, right? Um, and also that change that you did, you should have tested in your staging environment. So you should have known at that point if it was gonna break things. And if you're flying without a staging environment, you know, there's not much I can do with that. Um, all right. There you go, there you go. Um, did I miss anything? All right. Yes, young lady, you had your hand raised a minute ago. Oh, okay. How did I get to look this good? Years of sitting in a chair. Yes. Have you all played with any uh, tailors operating as far as Forge and Envoyer go? Um, so I've used Envoyer. I have a client who is on Envoyer, and it's neat. Um, I've, uh, it's, I will say Envoyer is really great, especially for, um, 
for no must, no fuss, relatively simple uh, systems and, and being able to just go in and do a push deploy. And I've got, I've got one guy with, you know, five production servers that are all running on Envoy. But the, the, they don't have a way to easily do like a, a, here's my, like, if they could hook into your AWS account or something like that, I'd find that really interesting. I actually sent them some requests, um, some feature requests, and I don't remember exactly what the thing was, but I sent them some feature requests because there was a, a missing piece that I needed, and, and they were responsive, so they would, you know, take a look at it and try to get to it, and then I, I stopped, I worked around it. Um, I've never played with Forge. I, I've just never had the need. Um, if, for me, it's too, Forge, for anyone who doesn't know, is a, um, a server, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure as a service, effectively, a uh, hosting service that um, is run by the Oracle guys. Right. Is it like Heroku in that it's a button, you, just, you kind of drop in a pack and no. magic happens? No. No, it's just a, it just provisions for different DPS providers, will provision basically like a Homestead style environment onto those. Oh. Houses. Yeah, all the, all the default stuff in a Laravel ENV when you first pull it up is all aimed at Forge. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh no, they they do they do well on that. Yeah. All right. Anything else, guys? All right. Like I said, there's the the blog post that you guys saw there. There's the sample code base. Um, my email is jwc at victoryctocom if you want to ask me any questions about it. Um, apparently, I didn't touch my computer for long enough, and it turned itself off. So that's a good segue. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs>